This week, I'm chatting with Ria Dolly Barbosa, a phenomenal Filipino American chef and the brains behind Petite Peso in downtown LA. I've been a bit of a fangirl of hers ever since trying her island inspired dishes at Squirrel, and I'm so stoked she finally has her own spot to showcase dishes that highlight her heritage, like adobo, halo halo, and of course, fried lumpia. I've always wanted to visit the Philippines, and this interview definitely reignited my wanderlust. Today, Ria and I talk about how the mix of indigenous, Malaysian, Chinese, and Spanish influences has made Filipino cuisine some of the most interesting in the world. We also chat about why, no matter what your profession is, we should all get over what she calls the crab in a bucket mentality. It was a great conversation, and I think you guys are going to enjoy it just as much as I did. Thank you so much for joining me, Ria. I know that you are literally one of the world's busiest women right now because you just <laughs> launched a restaurant in the middle of the Rona, which by the way, mm-hmm. hats off to you for that. Thanks. So thanks for coming by. I had a chance to hop down to Petit Peso last week. And first of all, the food is fucking delicious. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was like, it was wild just even being down there because most things are closed and you have become this mm-hmm. kind of tent pole in the community. It seems like it was one of the few businesses open. People were waiting in line for lunch. Mm-hmm. What made you to decide to A, open up during the pandemic mm-hmm. and, and stay open through all, all of the, the protests and everything? So we were actually trying to open in February. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's when things kind of started to happen. And uh, it, we actually put it off for a little bit just because we're like, well, let's wait it out. Let's see if it really is as big of an issue as people are making it. My partners and I, Tiffany and Robert, we had had at least half a dozen meetings on whether or not we should open. I don't know. I think it for me, I hadn't worked since December of last year when I left Paramount Coffee Project. So I was going a little stir crazy at home. One of the things that always happened growing up was that we would always have these like family, I call them family eat parties, whether it was birthdays or graduations or whatever other kind of celebration. It always felt nice to take care of and feed people. And that was the whole premise for Petit Peso. And so that the stir crazy coupled with a, well, we have the space and all of these, you know, a lot of the downtown restaurants in the area were closing. So, you know, it was the whole, well, Let's just open up and see what happens. We have a small space. We, you know, like we don't have to worry about people coming in. So let's just try it and try to feed people because I know not everyone knows how to cook for themselves or well, at least. So we just wanted to provide any sort of comfort we could to people in the surrounding area. Absolutely. And it is the ultimate comfort food. I do have to mm-hmm. say those bowls are just, oh, they make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, <laughs> uh, especially the adobo. Koichi, who did our the sound for us, he did our mm-hmm. intro song, Hats Off to Him. He had mentioned that there's an interesting story behind the name. <laughs> um, behind Petit Peso? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because to me, I'm like, oh, it's a translation, like small coin. I don't know. Yeah. And I've got a lot of small coin right now. (laughs) Very small. (laughs) Don't we all? Um, It's actually a really cool story. So my partners, uh, Rob and Tiff, they were the ones that kind of came up with the name. So peso is the name of the currency in the Philippines, kind of, you know, like the Mexican peso also. But once they told me their idea behind the name, you know, I was like, oh, that's kind of perfect. That's, that's great. You know, the peso has been undervalued for quite some time now, and it still currently is. And, you know, we wanted to bring value to the food and the culture. And so that's the reason behind choosing the name peso. That makes mm-hmm. so much sense. I think, you know, a lot of times in LA, we've been really waiting for this Filipino food movement to take off. Mm-hmm. And so many people, when I told them, I was like, oh my God, I just went down and you guys have to try this place. It's incredible. This Filipino food is so good. It's beautifully presented and so tasty. And it's exactly what you want right now. And they're like, well, what is, mm-hmm. what is Filipino food even what is that? And I tried to explain it. I was like, well, it's kind of like Thai food because they use coconut milk and it's kind of like Chinese food because they have these things called lumpia and it's like an egg roll. And it's kind of hard to explain. Mm -hmm. And there are 7,000 islands, which is crazy. And I imagine there's a lot of culinary diversity. How would you explain it? It's actually all of the things that you said and and so much more. It's an amalgamation of the the food that the, the natives that were there before and then all the Chinese influences from the trades also trade routes going to Malay. So, you know, there's a lot of influence, you know, Spanish, obviously. So we have Spanish and Chinese and Malaysian because there's there's this one dish that we have on the menu, kare kare. And it's very, for me, it's always kind of felt a little curry-like. 
don't quote me on this because I, I haven't looked it up in a minute, but I do remember reading at one point that that is how Malaysian people pronounce curry is the kare. Like if you, if you think about it, it sounds like curry, curry, kare, kare. Yeah, exactly. So, That's what I was thinking yeah. when you said that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really interesting. There are peanuts in it, which is also a very Malaysian thing to do in a yeah. curry, which is so good. I, I will put peanuts in anything. I love making like peanut noodles <laughs> and everything. Mm-hmm. The peanuts that you're using too are really, it's kind of interesting, right? It's a, it's a local woman. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, so Valerie and her husband, Zach, uh, they have they have this company called Spread the Love and they have different kinds of peanut butter. Some, they do some blends, but we like to use their lightly roasted, uh, just kind of like super plain to kind of really give that richness to the to the dish. And prior to using theirs, you know, we tried a couple different kinds. But once we made the switch, it just made it taste so much better and we, we can't use anything else now. I imagine do a lot of people use like a Skippy or something sort of more like mass produced? Yeah. I mean, that's what my parents used. Yeah. <laughs> Skippy or Jeff, you know. Well, like, I mean, ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, there's some oh, things no. I'm like, yeah. don't, don't mess with my Heinz ketchup. Like I, I love mm-hmm. the, the traditional, but the peanut flavor is so lovely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many of the dishes too have these really great uh, local producers that are, you know, young Angelinos and, and Southern Californians who are doing really cool and inspiring things. And I think that's the thing that's so cool about what you're doing is it's like really this like truly Filipino American food. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the flavors in Filipino food, because again, we talked mm-hmm. about like coconut and peanuts. What are some of the, the distinctly Filipino flavors or flavor combinations? Vinegar, mm. vinegar and garlic. You That's know, why that I love it so much. Like... Those are my two favorite ingredients out there. I'm like, it needs more acid, more garlic. Always. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of like the backbone behind a lot of the dishes. You'll you'll find vinegar. Um, we have a couple different kinds. There's cane vinegar. Is rice wine vinegar a thing, or is that more for Japanese yeah, cook? We'll use it, but. It's, I think we use more cane vinegar than anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that have like a, a sweetness to it? Or I, I don't know that I've ever actually used Is it sugar cane vinegar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'll find a couple different kinds at stores like Seafood City. But um, it, it does have a little bit of a sweetness, not as much as like a rice wine vinegar would, but it, it's, it has a really nice clean sharpness to it. Mm. Yeah, which is great for like adobo. The cane vinegar, uh, in contrast, is is a lot more sharper mm-hmm. and kind of like helps cut through. Mm. I love that. And it's an essential mm-hmm. ingredient in adobo, yeah? Vinegar? Absolutely, yeah. So not a lot of people know this, but the OG adobo actually has no soy in it. That's, you know, the Chinese influence. So it's called adobo puti, which is basically white adobo. And yeah, and it's just mostly just vinegar and garlic and spices and bay leaves and black pepper. Whoa, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting. And is that, is an adobo, is a is it a Spanish? Is that one of the Spanish influences or where did that? Def- yeah, definitely Spanish influence. My sous chef, Wendy, she's Mexican Guatemalan. We were actually talking about the adobo differences, like in her culture and, and in mine. For them, it's, it's vinegar and chilies and is more of like a spread. Versus, yeah, so adobo in the Philippines is, is another way to preserve meats that you're cooking. You know, it's, it's a tropical country. You don't have, you know, especially back then, you didn't have refrigeration. And so, you know, that vinegar kind of basically pickles whatever you're cooking, fish, pork, chicken, whatever. But yeah, that definitely made its way through the Spanish. Ah, it's interesting. And I, th- I think, uh, gosh, it's fascinating as much as obviously colonialism was a real fucking bitch and we all sure. wish it didn't mm-hmm. happen. It is really interesting to see how that really has influenced global culinary cultures and how that backbone is then translated with the local ingredients, the local culture, the local palates mm-hmm. and things like you guys have the, I think it's called Kinilao or Kinilao, the, yeah. the, the sort of it's it's ceviche. Like ceviche. Yeah. Which is so yeah. interesting. I like it because it's got the coconut milk in it. And I'm like, you put anything <laughs> with coconut milk, I'm sold. So, you know, it's sort of interesting to see how those things are then morph, you know, around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And that adobo is a really perfect instance of it. So yours is yours more in the traditional style then with no soy? Actually, ours is not the kind of like a mainstream adobo because we have coconut milk in ours. I like to say, because, you know, people will bitch and moan day and night, but I like to think that there are as many variations of adobo as there are islands in the Philippines. And it's all regional differences. My parents made theirs straight up, mostly vinegar, just a little bit of soy with pork and garlic bay leaf. And uh, what is that garlic bay leaf? Yeah, that's it. Um, But I, somewhere along the line, had it with coconut milk and 
I like, I personally like a little bit of heat, a little bit of spice. And so I just threw in red chili flakes one time and really loved how it came together. And, and, you know, with the coconut and everything, you kind of have this like richness and salty and, and vinegary, and also a little bit of spicy, Mm -hmm. um, from both the black peppercorn and the red chili flake. And she's like, yeah, that's the one, this is it. We're going to do it. like this." Ah, It's so (laughs) good. It is so good. And then there are these little, um, fried chicken skins that she puts on the top. You guys, Mm -hmm. oh my God, I love the textural contrast too. So you've got, you were saying the sweet, the savory, the heat, and then these little crunchy bits on the top. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. They're so good. Have you ever had those chicken skin chips? They're called chicken skins. Uh, No, I've heard of that, but I haven't had it yet. Oh my gosh. And they do like a Tom Yum flavor. I think you'd really, yeah, it's, they're pretty bomb and they're kind of here in LA. Oh, a couple, but yeah, the dobo is so good. It's such a great baseline, I think, for people to start with. And it, but that's been your signature dish as you've moved along. Mm-hmm. I first became familiar with your cooking at Squirrel. Some mm-hmm. of the best dishes on the menu, guys, FYI, were Rhea's development and doing. I thought it was so delicious. Can you talk a little nice. bit about like your your time there and the, the sort of the formation of your style, I guess, and the things that were on the yeah. menu? Yeah. It might have some Filipino influence. You know, I, I like to think that squirrel I don't know about now but like it was kind of like this like crazy lab like mad laboratory kind of thing where anything pretty much went we tried to keep things along the vein of preservation which is what it was you know at at its very core and so you know there are quite a few Filipino preparations that involve preserving just because you know like I mentioned before you know you want to try to extend the life of your food and you don't really want to have it spoil so you know there are a couple different ways but uh, I don't know. I, I really am thankful of the chance to kind of experiment and do a couple of dishes there. I ran them as specials and I, I think for the most part, just kept them as specials over there. So, you know, we did a Filipino uh, breakfast bowl one time with them um, while the GNB guys were still there. We dried and fried uh, like local sardines with a fresh tomato salad and a fried egg over rice. So that's actually like really typical. Like I remember, yeah, I, you know, it's one of those things that you hate as a kid, but appreciate now as an adult waking up to the smell of fried dried fish um, that my parents would make like on the weekends with garlic fried rice and, and eggs. So that was one of the dishes. Another one was I, I did a kara kara, but in the style of like a, a tureen. So I made rice crackers. I made like a really fresh bok choy slaw uh, that was dressed with the, that uh, fermented shrimp paste, the bagoon. And uh, the oxtails I braised and got all the, as much collagen as I, as I could out of it and then took the meat off the bone, shredded it, and then reduced that collagen, packed it all in the terrain mold and pretty much let it set overnight so we could cut slices of it. And so you have the rice, the bok choy, the bagoong, the, and then the, the oxtail, like all in one bite. So that was a fun special. Oh, that um, sounds so I good. <laughs> I love also, I'm one of those crazy people. I love, I shouldn't say crazy. It's just, I mean, maybe crazy for a white person, but I, I love um, shrimp, like fish paste and fish sauce. Ooh. Like whenever I go to Thai food, I'm like extra non mm-hmm. I, Like I just douse my food in it, which is why I like that uh, bikol bowl. Cause I think that's got some of yes. the, um, one more time, the name of the shrimp paste or the dried fish paste, but, but, but gone. Bagoong. Bagoong. Yeah. So tasty. It's like two O's. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. I think for people like someone might think, oh, fish paste. I don't know about that. It just adds Mm -hmm. this like really, it's it's almost undetectable if you don't know what it is. It's like a layer of umami that it's like, you don't know why it's so good, but it's just adds another layer. Same with like anchovy paste. I'll just kind of like pop some of that into sauce or whatever. And it doesn't taste fishy. It just Mm -mm. adds that like je ne sais quoi. That's extra fun. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Extra depth, you know, extra Ah. oomph. Yeah, totally. And I I was reading actually that uh, John Hamm was a fan of your adobo, right? With Red Squirrel. Oh my God. I, yes, I, uh, I totally forgot about that. I was like, um, oh my God, I'm fangirling out. He is definitely one of my celeb crushes. Um, oh, totally. So cool. But everyone from John Hamm yeah. to like, to older, you know, Filipino parents, grandparents would come in and it was mm-hmm. like just a sort of cross-generational, you know, bender that everybody yeah. seemed to love. So I'm so glad to see it on the menu at Petit Peso still. It's like your signature yeah. dish, baby. 
Oh my God. I totally forgot that John, John Hamm part. He actually came back and like popped his head in and said, thank you. That was really delicious. And I think I was like, Oh. <laughs> Hello, Dreamboat. Oh man, he's so cool. He's kind of become a fixture over on the east side. I know he uh, used to mm-hmm. dine at Little Dom's quite a bit, and it was just like I don't mm-hmm. know. Everybody describes him as being a lovely human. Super cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious because I know this is something you've been now you've worked at Squirrel, you did a PCP, which is a great coffee shop and have, you know, developed your own dishes along the way. But something I hear a lot about is that when you're working at a, someone else's restaurant, a lot of times the ownership of those dishes can go to the person who's the owner of that restaurant. Mm-hmm. What is your advice to people as they're starting to build a name for themselves around a dish that may be something like adobo that's really personal to you and your personal, you know, family history and your story? Yeah. How do you retain ownership over that intellectual property as you're developing yourself is it possible uh, (laughs) I you know I I think it is you know and and you would have to you know look at the fine print obviously for me that you know having had to sign a couple of those along the way it was more of like a how much of myself can I give you know kind of thing you should look at the fine print and you know ask questions like can I if I run it as a special and not something that will make it on the menu like does that does that count and if it does maybe you don't do it there um Mm -hmm. maybe you just hold on to it until you find the right spot but yeah I mean it really you know it sucks because you every place that I wanted uh that I've worked at you know it's like I can I know what I'm capable of and I want to share this food with everybody but you kind of have that clause hanging over your head a little bit. It's like, okay, well, maybe I should, you know, like not pull back and, you know, just be careful and ask questions. You know, that has to be like the number one thing is ask questions. Like if I do it, yeah, if I run it as a special, is does that count? You know, since it's not a, a permanent fixture on the menu kind of thing. So um, I don't know. I mean, it shouldn't stifle your creativity. It shouldn't do any of that. I mean, you can also just play with stuff at home too and, have dinner parties with your friends, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fingers but, crossed. <laughs> I know. You have to be careful. It's easy to get carried away and want to create things and, and, you know, make some really awesome food. But if you get into a legal situation afterwards, then nobody wants to do that. So. Mm-mm. No. Yeah. It's really hard. I think a lot about this with me personally as well in the creative space. Mm-hmm. I love the idea of being open and vulnerable. Like I'm, I've always been one of those people that's just kind of an open book and shared ideas that I have for television show concepts or stories that I want to write. And I want to believe that everybody has the best intentions, but oftentimes those things like maybe it just goes in the back of someone's consciousness and they're not yeah. realizing they're stealing it, but it really mm-hmm. sucks when you're yeah. like, that was my idea. And like, I worked on that for so long and that was like my thing. And now all of a sudden you're seeing like, wait a minute, how is there a whole issue of that now out? And like, uh-huh. I wasn't involved in it or like, it's just, Ooh. it's a weird, feeling. Yeah. it happens, It ha- you know, and mm-hmm. there's also the collective consciousness, right? Is like, sometimes, you know, you want to think, oh, that was my idea, but also was it, you know, then everyone's reading the same things. Everyone's can right. have the same information. Um, but I think it's also important to remember too, that like, even though someone else is maybe doing it, doesn't mean that you can't do it in your special way, you know? Exactly. You know, there've been a couple of instances where it's like, I have this idea and then, you know, I'll read or see someone else doing it. It's like, Oh damn it. I should have done it first, you know? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean you can't do it better or not even do it better. Just do it with your own, your own own, special sauce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard. So anyway, all by way of saying, I'm really glad that you've now got your own thing. And it's so very clearly you, the design is so cool down there, by the way. Like I love Mm -hmm. the, um, the street art in that alleyway. And then also on the floors, that's a local artist, right? Yeah. That's her. He's actually a friend of uh, one of my partners, Tiff. They've known each other for some time and you know, like she's a fan of his art. and Now I am. He freehanded everything, the floors, the that little like overhead on the in the doorway he just showed up with paint brushes and you know paint and just kind of did it it was amazing really cool it's really yeah. it's almost sort of like retina adjacent it's similar it's but it's a little more flowy i really like it and just even like walking up to the window you see like this really mm-hmm. cool really cool street art really cool pieces it's visually stimulating and then you see the mm-hmm. pastry case which is full of all kinds of treats and goodies there are ensaymadas in there there's some i think polvorones is that right yeah yeah Polver- um mm-hmm. Those are so tasty. What is an ensaymada? Like, what technically, what is that? Ooh, okay. Uh, I like this question because it's a fun one. So it's essentially like a Filipino-style brioche. It's got egg yolks, and the method is a little bit different, but it looks and tastes the closest to brioche. 
and it's a, it's a dough. So you kind of have to roll it out and then you brush butter and sugar inside of it. And then you roll it into a, a long log and then you coil that around uh, so that it, it proofs and bakes into like a little bit of a, sp- into a spiral. Mm. So it's yeah. like a brioche shaped, like a cinnamon roll. Yeah. Sort of, but yeah, Fili- <laughs> <It's a laughs> Filipino, it's a, like a say, sweet and savory Filipino brioche cinnamon roll minus a cinnamon. Yeah. <laughs> I love the, like the cheese though, the cheddar cheese on top. That's not a traditional thing, is it? Or is it? It is. Yeah. Huh. So yeah. So it, a uh, traditional ensamada is, is exactly how we prepare it. Uh, growing up, it's always been a little bit on the sweet side for me. And so I kind of pulled the sweetness back a little bit. So it's like a slightly sweetened buttercream mm. and then it gets like really sharp uh, hooks, one year cheddar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just microplane that over the top. It's so pretty. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's, a really cool it's a showstopper like if people you know when they see that they'll poke their head and be like hey what is that i want to try that so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah for anyone who out there who's thinking like cheddar cheese on a sort of sweet roll i don't know think yeah. of it like like cheddar cheese and apples right it's like there's just mm-hmm. like that sweet savory like it, and especially the sharp cheddar i think really it works really really yeah. nicely and then um so the pulverones or something again like we're seeing a little bit of that spanish influence again is it's sort of a fine powder like an almond Almond flour is that what it is? Um, well, we use we use regular uh, wheat flour um, <laughs> for that, but you could absolutely you know switch it up. So polvo means dust, mm. uh, and so you know it. Growing up, I always thought they were kind of dry and made me cough, you know, a couple times <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to eat it. All been there, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to make it more short bready. The binder is butter you know the og ways with margarine because that's what they had back then Mm -hmm. or in the philippines but i thought you know like what what if i did brown butter instead like that could be tasty and so that is now the binder brown butter toasted flour it's really cool because you don't bake it you toast the flour you essentially cook the flour and then you mix everything with it the toasted flour sugar milk powder and then the butter and then whatever else you want to add to it, vanilla extract. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you mix that up to cut until it it's like a like a wet sandy texture. Mm-hmm. And then from there you can shape them. We use cookie presses for ours, but there's a there's a traditional pulverone press, which is it can either be an oval or a circle. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pull rum. Oh, they're so yummy. It's kind of, um, I guess the texturally, if you've ever had those like De La Rosa candies from Mexico, which I really like, that's mm-hmm. probably technically their, their version yeah. of a pull or something like that, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they're so tasty. So she puts it together in these really beautiful pastry boxes, which by the way, you should probably take to your next little socially distanced picnic. They're very pretty to be <laughs> put together. And the money rolls, oh my God, the money rolls are like a King's Hawaiian kind of like that sweet. And then like the cinnamon, oh man, they're tasty too. Is that, a, is oh, that yeah. a traditional dessert as well or a traditional pastry? Or is that um, well, that's another Spanish influence thing. So we call it money rolls because the whole peso and the, like, it, it's so good. It's money kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. um, but it also goes by Spanish bread and senorita bread. Um, you know, people will, a lot of Filipino people will better recognize it under those names, but um, we call them money rolls because they're so good. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, they really are. Yeah. Oh my God. I was like, why did I only get two of these? This was a huge misstep. <laughs> Shame on me. I love that. But I'm so happy you're starting to do the Halo Halo too. It's mm-hmm. another really great sweet option. Is that um, more of the like uh, Malaysian influence or like where, do, what's the deal with the Halo Halo? What's the story there? You know what? It's actually, it's pronounced Halo Halo. So oh. like, yeah, all good. It's okay. So um, I was talking to somebody who was asking me how to pronounce it. And I said, just think of it like in the Philippines, we use short vowels. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's not really that like long, like instead of like A, it's A hmm. in a lot of, yeah, in a lot of the words. So yeah, so it's hollow, hollow. What is it yeah. though? It technically, it's, it's sort of like a, I would say maybe sort of similar to like a Taiwanese shave ice or something. It's like layered yeah. all kinds of goodies. There's tapioca balls, there's fresh fruit, mm-hmm. there's coconut cream, yeah. ice. Mm-hmm. It's like the ultimate summer dessert. I, yeah, it's like parfait-ish. It's, it's shave ice, ice-ish. It's actually a little bit, uh, the ice itself is a little bit larger than a shave ice. It's mm-hmm. not as fine or fluffy. I think it's, I think it more so has to do the fact that it's so friggin' hot 
that you kind of want it to hold on to a little bit of uh, structure before it completely melts. <laughs> um, so it'd be soup. It would be soup if you had that like the thinly shaped Taiwanese ice. It would mm-hmm. just be gone. Yeah. So we we shape. Yeah. <laughs> we shave it a little bit coarser mm-hmm. just so you kind of have that like crunchy texture with it. But the way we do ours in contrast to the OG, so our version is actually vegan and it's something that I've kind of been like kicking around playing with. We're very conscious of the way people want to eat. You know, people want to eat better, whether it's vegetarian or, or vegan, you know, some people are going all the way there, but right. like we, we want to try to be inclusive. There's so many people have gone vegan now at this point. It's mm-hmm. smart to be doing it that way. So traditionally, is it usually condensed milk and then you switch to the coconut or? Condensed milk and evaporated milk. It's usually got flan and like ube ice cream on top Mm. i just wanted to do like a fresher more summery take nectarines are insane right now so we've been putting nectarines in there and i just wanted like these really bright summery flavors so the guava pink guava we made a syrup there's also uh, passion fruit jellies because in, um, in traditional halo halo, you have the sweet beans and then the little jellies and like the coconut, coconut strands and all of that. You know, the way we wanted to do it a little bit different was we got passion fruit puree that we turned into jellies. So you kind of have that like bright acidic pop as you're eating it. Sweet jackfruit, pink guava. And then we make our own condensed oat milk. Ooh. Um, yeah. That's yeah. really so cool. That I cool. love oat milk. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense because I feel like oat milk has just got this creamy nature to it that almond milk just mm-hmm. doesn't have. It works better in yeah. lattes and things like that. So that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Oh my yeah. God, that sounds like everything I need <laughs> for a hot day like today. Holy cow. It couldn't have come out at mm-hmm. a better time. Yeah. <laughs> I love all the tropical flavors are my favorite. Me too. You talked a little bit um, originally about how there's this really interesting mix, and we've talked about the Spanish influence, a little bit of the Malaysian influence, but you also mentioned the indigenous influence. What does that look like? Is that more of the using the local produce or like what what does indigenous Filipino cooking even look like? That's a good question. And that's something I'm I'm starting to to look into because a lot of the food and currently have more of that um, Spanish influence to it. So, and so like looking into, you know, everyone's doing the whole decolonization and just kind of like looking up at what was there before everyone else came along kind of thing. So I'm just starting to look into it. It's, it's curiosity. I, I, I want to know what they were eating. And I think that it would be cool to kind of have that play a part uh, like a big part in, in petite peso in the future. And that's a good question. I mean, I'm assuming it's, you know, local, whatever they grew locally and nose to tail eating as we know it, you know? Yeah, Uh definitely more fish. I mean, you know, like we have, well, I I guess here we go again. (laughs) Uh, we do have our own version of escabeche. Mm -hmm. And so it's so deep in there, you know, it's over Mm -hmm. 300 years of influence, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to figure out what what's behind that. Right. But it'd be interesting to to unpack. Uh, I mean, I'm mm-hmm. curious too, we talked a little bit about how there are these 7,000 islands, which is like mind blowing. It's hard to even think mm-hmm. about an island chain like that. Is there a, a ton of regional diversity? Is there a way to kind of break that down? Sort of similar to like, okay, well, the North eats more spicy food and the South is really mm-hmm. more coconut based or, and now I'm talking like, it's oh. like you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. you know what I mean? Definitely, you know, in the South from uh, my uncle and his family living there, you know, it's a huge Muslim population. So, you know, you're not going to see pork in that area. And it was actually really cool because the last time I saw him a couple of years ago, you know, we're so used to longanisa, like pork longanisa as like a breakfast item and, and like a lot of other Filipino American spot. And this is something that I've, oh, whatever, I'm just going to say it. Um, because it's something that I kind of wanted to uh, recreate uh, in my own way is that It was, he brought over tuna longanisa one time and it was the most delicious thing. And, you know, like maybe not tuna, maybe like another, you know, fish of some kind, but I think it would be so cool to make a non-pork longanisa. That Um, sounds fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think like uh, even just like shrimp sausages, I love, I think they're so good. So I could feel like that. Oh yeah. Do you work at all? I know, um. Amboy just started. I know I may have seen that right. Mm-hmm. Um, Amboy? Oh, yeah. No, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Amboy. Amboy. Um, I know that he just launched a, a butcher. Is that correct? Or yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't made my way. No. Oh, uh, well, I haven't I haven't made my way over to Alvin's spot yet, but someone brought us a burger the other day, though. It was awesome. But uh, yeah, it, it looks like he's taking that uh, butcher, butchery angle, which is super cool. 
if he's open on Mondays, I could probably make my way over on a Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You work so hard, dude. I really appreciate you taking your, your, you know, one day off a week to chat with me about all this. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, no um, the space that you're in actually is really cool because there have been so many other great Filipino restaurants in that spot. So it's sort of like a built-in interest. What have you mm-hmm. noticed as, as this movement has progressed? Do you feel like it's really picked up steam? Do you feel like it's still moving forward? Like what is the state of the Filipino food movement in Los Angeles right now? COVID aside, I think people are still trying, you know, I, I would get like the occasional DM or, you know, just, you know, like people coming up like young, young Filipino cooks, young Filipino chefs, just like saying like, this is really cool. What are you doing? And it's just like, I'm, I mean, this is just food that, you know, I grew up eating with like, I don't know my current twist on it. I, I don't want it to be this trendy, flashy, like it's here and then everyone forgets about it, you know, the next year kind of thing. I think it needs to develop organically. So there's there's this thing called crab mentality. It's very prevalent in Filipinos where it's like someone gets to the top, you know, like you envision like a bucket of crabs, right? There's one that's climbing to the top and then the other one just kind of pulls it back down kind of thing. It sucks and it's unfortunate, but you know, it's good to address it because we should be pushing each other forward instead of like saying, you know, oh, I can, you know, like, why do I need to buy that? You know, my, I can get the same thing from my mom at home or, you know, I can make the same thing at home. I think it's important to support and to kind of help push it forward by supporting, by going. I'm, <laughs> this is kind of, this is going to sound weird, but I am definitely terrified of like older Filipino folks and like the ones that actually speaks. I don't speak Tagalog. I know a few words, but um Whenever they come to the shop, I'm just like, oh no, please don't, you know. It sucks that that is like my knee-jerk reaction. And so I think we just need to keep pushing. I think we need to keep supporting. And yeah, you might be able to have your mom cook it at home, but we're not going to be around if that keeps being like the main thought. And so I think supporting it is like a big thing. Like we've gotten support from, you know, a lot of people that are non-Filipino, which is kind of weird that that's how it's like often plays out. But I think there are a lot more supportive Filipinos out there that are like trying to like push it forward and like keep that playfulness and inventiveness alive because like, yeah, you can make all that fun stuff, but it's kind of fun to like push it a little bit and make it not so mom and poppy so that it's not something that you can make at home, that you have to come out and, and try it and that sort of thing. My friends at Lhasa and Mamser and the the recently... Uh, closed down RIP Irenia down in OC. Like they were doing amazing stuff, but I think they're still doing something on the side. They just don't have that brick and mortar anymore. Hmm. I think, you know, I hope it continues to push forward. You know, it might not be, I don't know, this like big bang of like, oh my God, all these Filipino spots opening up everywhere. It feels like it's definitely going at its own pace. And I think we need to foster and support the ones that are trying. Totally. It's like a universal message. I think for so many people is like, just, Mm -hmm. hey, like support each other a little bit. Don't don't Mm -hmm. be like crabs in a bucket trying to drag each other down. You know, there's room for everybody mm-hmm. to exist. And what you're doing, I think too, it's it's so interesting when you tell me about being, you know, a little bit hesitant or nervous when an older, you know, grandma, grandpa, whatever yeah. walks in and being nervous about that. To me, I would be so proud of what you're doing because what you're doing is different. Like it is different from what you would get in a home. I've got, you know, Filipino oh, friends thanks. and I've eaten in the home yeah. and it's wonderful. And like, gosh, no one's ever going to be able to beat your mom's cooking. But what you're doing is so elevated. It's so cool. The ingredients, I mean, like mom is not using peds and Barnett pork. Okay. Like, <laughs> I wish she was. However, yeah, pan frying chicken skins to put on top of the adobo, you know, and all these beautiful herbs and, and ingredients that you're using from local producers is definitely different. Mm-hmm. And it's your own spin, vegan, hollow, hollow, like, hello, mm-hmm. mama ain't doing that. So you really are offering your own, your own voice and your own take on something. And it's cool. And I think it really does have staying power. Anything that is like true and authentic does and, and will. Mm-hmm. So awesome. thank you. You got a good thing going there. So right. tell me, I, I love lumpia. That's like a signature dish. You got to have it. Any great Filipino restaurant or any Filipino home for that matter. It's come, they're all coming out and they're just, you know, in abundance. But what is the difference between that and egg roll? It's actually an egg roll. Um, so the fried ones that we make at the shop, um, the it, it's technically called lumpia uh, Shanghai. 
So if you think about it, it's basically an egg roll. But ours are uh, typically thinner. The way I grew up eating it and the way my parents made it and showed me how to make it is we make, um, we kind of like fill like, yeah, it's like a small, it's smaller, thinner, cooks quickly and is like super crunchy uh, as a result. So the ones, yeah, the ones we make at the shop are is Lumpia Shanghai versus like Lumpia uh, Sariwa, which is the, um, the fresh Lumpia. Mm. Um, which is really good with like typically with like bam- uh, bamboo hearts and and all that good stuff, um, but it is branched off of the egg roll family, I guess. Yeah, and that's the Chinese influence is the lumpia right there. Yeah. Do you happen to know? I, I, I and I don't know how the Chinese influence ended up coming through. Was it from trade? What trade? What okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely trade. Uh, the so the the part where um, or the part of the country where. My mom is from, so we are outside of Iloilo, so we're in the center of the country, um, in the Visayas. And uh, there's a port right there in Iloilo where there used to be a lot of like Chinese trade. And you can see it because uh, there's a regional specialty in that area called Pancit Molo. You know, Pancit is noodles, and that's what people know it as. But there's not actually noodles. It's like a chicken, and it's a chicken soup base with a pork and shrimp dumpling. And that's Pancit Molo. And I've made it a couple times. Uh, I think I, I did it as like a, that summer long or that year long pop up at uh, Wild at Canale for the month of October. I made the Pancit Molo dish. But yeah, I mean, like that, the dumplings, like it, it was like a huge, like heavy um, Chinese trading port right there uh, in Iloilo. So, yeah, that stuff like that. We have our own version. I like to think of it is kind of like similar to like our version of like ramen. It's called bok choy. It's got noodles and the pig parts and the broth that's been like going on for hours. It's like, you know, ramen, not ramen, but like it's our own like noodle pork based soup and stuff. But yeah, like huge Chinese influence from like the, the noodles to the dumplings to the egg roll. Yeah. Gosh, it's so funny because like the food right now that you guys have on the menu is so perfect for the summertime. These like beautiful bowls and they're just really mm-hmm. bright and fresh and lovely. I can't wait to see what you do in the fall because some of that stuff sounds <laughs> just like so wonderful for when, if and when it starts raining. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming by, Ria. Tell everybody where they can follow you. You can follow me on Instagram at Ria Dolly Barbosa. It's my full name. And you can also follow at Petit Peso for all fun things going on at the shop. You know, we are trying to do weekly rotating specials. So keep a lookout. Usually the beginning of the week or so, we'll post it up there. You know, what we'll have like from like Wednesday. Perfect. And is the Halo Halo the special this week or what do you have on this week? Halo Halo is on till the end of summer. So yes. don't worry, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to see me down there very, very soon. Oh my gosh. Yay. So perfect for summertime. Well, thank you awesome. again. And we will see yeah. you down at the shop pronto. And of course, guys, feel free to give me a follow on Instagram as well at Krista Simmons and at Fork in the Road Media. We'll see you next week.